This is the ME-262, the world's first jet fighter plane. The Nazis created it near the end of World War II, and it was faster and more powerful than any other fighter in the world. It could shoot you down and fly away before you even knew it was there. It was so powerful that the Germans hoped it would actually help them win the war. Jets were so revolutionary that American pilots had a hard time fighting against them. But there was one group that wanted to go after these jets. So much so that they actually painted the tails of their planes red, so the Germans knew who was coming after them. They became known as the Red Tails, and on their first mission to Berlin, they shot down three jets. They were also known as the Tuskegee Airmen, a group of all African-American pilots. My leader, and the second ship was me, and two Fockwolves came on my right. I turned right and put up a stone wall of bullets. I wanted to meet and film interviews with some of these Tuskegee veterans and hear their stories firsthand. What was it like to face off against the German jets? I don't know any of these veterans, but I do know Ben Mac Jackson, a high school student who has found a calling in interviewing World War II veterans. I reached out to him to see if he'd be willing to find and interview members of the Red Tails. Sure enough, he found two Tuskegee veterans in his community and agreed to go on this journey to hear their stories and understand what these men went through. Ben has become very interested in learning about World War II by talking with and filming interviews with veterans. He's even started a non-profit organization called the World War II Veterans History Project to preserve their stories. I, I've interviewed over 60 World War II veterans to date in the past three years, and uh, I develop personal relationships with a lot of these veterans, uh, local veterans of, uh, in particular. I've learned so much about life and love and, and everything really that put together uh, 70 years ago, they were in the world's greatest conflict. And uh, it's hard to uh, remember that sometimes when you're talking to them and they're sharing advice about uh, peace and things like that and about all these things. And it's incredible to, to know that over 70 years ago, they were on the front lines of, 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 a, of a war and uh, sharing such incredible advice with me as a teenager in the 21st century. Well, my first interview with, was with Lieutenant Colonel Charles Konsler, and uh, he was in the Army Air Corps during the war and was a fighter pilot. And uh, I was 13 at the time, and he was 92. And despite this extremely large age gap, we got along extremely well and had a wonderful interview, and I learned so much about his time in service. And it really motivated me to keep going and continue to interview these heroes and learn their stories to preserve them for future generations. It was a big moment for Ben to interview two Tuskegee Airmen. One was Daniel Keel, and the other, George Hardy. What is your name, rank, and your branch of service? Ben started his interview by asking these men why they joined the service. Their stories started out the same. They both joined to serve their country after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and then discovered they wanted to learn to fly. Well, I graduated from high school in uh, June 1942, and war was going on. Six months earlier, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Many people were enlisting, but I turned 17 the same month I graduated. In 1942, I had to wait for a year to go in. And it's good I waited that year, because during that year, I decided I wanted to fly. And the reason why I wanted in the Air Force, I wanted to go in the Air Force, because I noticed you had a clean bed to sleep, you had clean clothes to wear, you got three square meals each a day, and if you was a flying personnel, you got 50% more pay. That's the reason why I took the exam to make sure I could get in in case I was drafted, and was sending us to Tuskegee Army Base for two months of pre-flight training. Ben was so interested in their story that he traveled to Tuskegee, Alabama to visit Moton Field, which is now the Tuskegee Airmen National Historic Site.
The three Tuskegee Airmen that I interviewed all trained right here at Moton Field in Tuskegee, Alabama, and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to explore this historic landmark. This is where my friends George Hardy and Daniel Keel underwent some of their flight training during the war. Moton Field was a segregated facility reserved for African Americans. During World War II, the Army, like much of the United States, was segregated with white and black service members operating in units of their own race. Well, I went to Keister Army, Airf uh, Army Airfield for basic training, six weeks of basic training. Every person in the Army must go through that. Then I went to the uh, Tuskegee Institute. They stuck in five months of college work for us high school guys. And I went to Tuskegee for we were three months before they cut that short, and I entered aviation cadet training in December 1943. And graduated in September 1944 as a second lieutenant and a pilot. So when we went through training, we had white army instructors. And I would say that I got along so well with my instructor, I thought he did a good job. I'm not sure, some people say a lot of us were washed out, but uh, later when the service integrated, I was with white outfits after that. And talking about these guys, whites had a terrible time too, getting through a lot of them washed out, you know. So uh, I'm not sure how much more our problem could have been, what not. Well, I got training in different types of airplanes. I got training in a P-40. I went to gunnery training at, at Tuskegee. Then I moved to Wallover, South Carolina, where I trained in a P-47, combat training in a fighter airplane. P-47 was a very good airplane, and uh, our instructors were people who had flown the P-47 in combat in Europe. And we got about 60-some hours in the P-47, then we shipped overseas in February 45. I was assigned to the 99th Fighter Squadron, 332nd Fighter Group at Ramatelli Air Base in Italy. Overseas, we transitioned into the P-51. And in uh, March and April, I flew 21 combat missions with the 99th Fighter Squadron. And by the time I got over there, we didn't have many German airplanes around. The only airplanes we saw in the air were the jets. Ben was getting close to someone that might have actually fought against the German jets. But while George Hardy was in Europe fighting the war, Daniel Keel told Ben about a war he was fighting in the United States against segregation. When he left Tuskegee, Alabama and arrived in Texas for more training, he was met by an officer, Lieutenant Colonel Phelps, who did not believe African Americans could make good pilots. As soon as we got off the train at Midland Army Air Base, a Lieutenant Colonel came up to us and told us that he was Lieutenant Colonel Phelps, that he was the Deputy Commander of Midland Army Air Base, and that he, Lieutenant Colonel Phelps, was born in Texas, raised in Texas, expected to die in Texas, and that we Negro officers didn't know our place while we were in the state of Texas, he spelled it out for us. One, we could not eat in the officer's mess. Two, we could not go in the officer's club. Three, we could not sit in the officer's section of the theater. And four, if we went to town, we had to ride the back of the bus. 12 o'clock shop. After hearing the level of discrimination against him, it made me angry. I couldn't understand why someone would treat another person that way and try to prevent them from achieving their dreams. Of course, when interviewing an African-American World War II veteran, I asked a lot of questions about what racial discrimination they went through. And it varied between the veterans that I interviewed extremely. It varied a lot. Daniel Keel had extreme racism from the beginning of his service all the way to the end. He was hounded by white officers and white personnel from the day he went in to the end of his service. Two or three days later, a couple of white officers came of our quarters and told us the general was on the base and had ordered every white officer to meet with him in the base theater to discuss our situation. That's where they were going, and after the meeting was over, they would give us a report. About an hour or so later, the same two men came back and gave us a report. After all the white officers had assembled in the theater, the general threw out the question, how should we Negro officers be treated while we're on the base? And we were told that the discussion became so heated that a fist fight broke out amongst some of the officers in the theater. And the only way the general could quell the melee was by having the national anthem played. After order was restored, the general told the officers in the theater that though we were Negroes, we were officers in the, in the United States Army Air Force. And being officers in the United Air Force, we will be treated with the same respect, duty, and privileges of any other officer on the base, period. Walked off the podium with the base commander 
and no sooner had the door closed on the two men, when Phelps told the officers in the theater before dismissing them, he forget even those Negroes officers was the last thing he ever did. Two weeks later, he tried to have me and five of my classmates again court-martial. Again, he failed. Two weeks before graduation, a couple of white officers came over and told us Phelps was doing everything in his power to have us sent to some godforsaken island in the Pacific. There were a lot of Americans during the 1940s who extremely doubted the African-American skill in, well, in battle and also just in regular day-to-day -day life. And the, an American uh, Army study in 1925 uh, said that the African American was physically capable to be in the army and to serve on positions in the combat and front lines, but they were not mentally or morally capable to serve in a combat position or to fly aircraft. So that right there was a very telling sign that the uh, American public and also the government uh, and during some part of World War II was not as uh, understanding of what the African Americans could really do. That study also showed that the African American's brain was 25% smaller than the average American's brain, which was completely uh, false, of course, and that was proved wrong during World War II, of course, and with the Tuskegee Airmen and their ex immense successes uh, during the war. I mean, shooting down an ME-262 fighter was an incredible feat, and it required such, such uh, talent and such uh, strategy. The jet was, the only thing about the jet was it was much faster than we were. But uh, our plane was more agile. And uh, we had a mission to Berlin. I was not on a mission to Berlin. On a mission to Berlin, we shot down three of those 262s. And uh, they would come in and attack us and our planes were able to turn quickly on them and get them, fire at them before they got out of range and he shot down three of them on that uh, mission, so uh, they were vulnerable in that respect. Plus, one other thing is uh, they didn't have many of them, and the pilots only had so much training in them, see? Because by that time, Germany was running out of pilots and airplanes, and they didn't have space to train them. Anytime they had an airplane on an airfield someplace, we'd shoot it up. So we had air superiority, so it was, it was a dying effort on their part at that time. I wanted to get George Hardy to talk about his combat experience, but sometimes it can be difficult for them to open up at first. I do my research before meeting them which gives me a better understanding and appreciation for what they went through. It allows me to have a two-way conversation with them, and once they see that I am knowledgeable about their experiences, they open up more. Oftentimes, the families of the veterans are present during the interview and learn things about their loved ones that they never knew before. On the missions I was on, we didn't tangle with them, or well, they didn't come in and attack us. So the only time I fired my guns was on strafing missions. After the, escorting the bombers, if we had fuel left, we would go back over Germany looking for targets of opportunity. Anything on the highways or on the railroad tracks, trains, was my first experience strafing some tanks, and they were firing back at us. That was the first time I saw it. I didn't know what it was in the first place, but it was shells coming back at us and I was hit once, but it was minor. And uh, the, the problem was I thought it was worse than it was because I saw this bright light in the plane. The shell came through the side of the plane, which opened up the side with this light on my feet, which is normally dark, see. And I thought something else happened, but it was just a minor thing, so. That's the only time I was hit. But, uh, but it was interesting the first time to see shells coming back at you. So. While George Hardy was flying combat missions, Daniel Keel was still in the United States trying to finish his training. He was eager to get to Europe, but Lieutenant Colonel Phelps continued to try and prevent him from ever becoming a pilot. Of course it made me feel angry that anyone could treat someone like that and prevent them from flying. And it was it's just absolutely incredible and shocking to me that that was the case. I now believe when the 27 of us were sent back to Tuskegee to train to become pilots, not a single one of us was supposed to make it all the way through. You see, the second week on the base when we walked into our AINI class, we saw 10 X's on the blackboard. When I instructed to walk then and, and said, good morning, he said, see those 10 X's on the board? We said, yep. Come Friday, 10 of you men will no longer be in this class. 
Momentarily was stunned by his remarks, and then we said, almost in unit, Lieutenant Colonel Phelps, that rascal tentacles had followed us all the way over the Tuskegee Army Air Base. Come Friday, tentacles was thrown out of pilot training. Daniel Keel continued to fight to become a pilot and did eventually earn his flight wings, but it was too late for him to join the fighting overseas. George Hardy continued to fly combat missions, escorting bombers from Italy to their targets in Germany. Ben felt comfortable enough to ask him what it was like to face the dreaded German anti-aircraft guns. I asked him about the German 88 gun, which was one of the most feared weapons of World War II and could shoot down planes flying at extremely high altitudes. 88 guns, they were normally used for, uh, to fire at the bombers. And we would escort the bombers, but when the bombers reached the target, that's when they would, the target would be defended normally, say. And when that happened, we would pull off to the side and let them go through the target and meet them on the other side. Because uh, while they're in being fired at from the ground, the German airplanes weren't going to attack them anyway. So, But we did see that, and I was amazed at how uh, many shells would come up, and those B-17s would just keep formation and fly right through all those black bursts. Well, you realize those guys were 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds flying formation and they're holding formation and you had to admire them for that. Sometimes a plane would get hit and it would have to pull out, you know, but most of them kept formation and kept going, so. Mm -hmm. And the bomber crews, when, did you ever interact with them and were they grateful for your support? Well, they, they were grateful, but we, we didn't get to really meet them. Rarely did we meet them because remember, segregation was rigidly enforced during World War II. And we were at one base and they were at other bases and, uh, and there was very little chance to mingle with them or get to know them in any way. And uh, to me, I always said the Army's number one goal was segregation. Number two was winning a war. And that's the way it appeared to me because they, it was amazing how they were, had rules in place to ensure segregation took place wherever you went. So. Personally, I've never interviewed a uh, bomber crewman who was guarded by the Tuskegee Airmen at a point in time. Um, I'm sure that there are, they are out there, whether they know it or not. The Tuskegee Airmen flew under a very distinctive uh, paint scheme during World War II, the red tail. They painted their tails to a distinctive red to stand out uh, from other outfits. And um, whether the bomber crew knew that they were African Americans or not, who knows? But there were at times certain crews that did notice the difference in fighter escorts um, because the fighters wouldn't veer off and go for kills. They would stick with the bombers. And once they figured out that they were African Americans, they were very impressed and they requested the Tuskegee Airmen's uh, be on their mission certain times. So they gained the reputation for discipline, they gained the reputation for uh, being this well-trained outfit that would stick with them and uh, not abandon them to go after personal glory. I think it would be really remarkable to be able to hear the story of a bomber uh, crewman who was defended by the Tuskegee Airmen on a bombing mission. This is George Deptula. He was a bomber crewman during the Second World War. And that young man is me. Back in the 1990s, I, like Ben, also interviewed World War II veterans. And I always remember my time with Mr. Deptula because he told me about a special mission. A mission that almost cost him his life. The war was far away then. I, I went on eight or ten missions of uh, to Ploesti, the Romanian oil fields, you rarely find people alive today that went on more than four or three of them. And uh, the thing about that is, is, is that uh, when you go through that ordeal and you go through the bombing and you face the enemy aircraft and uh, gunfire from below, uh, you you're not any stronger, but you are uh, you're aware of the value of life. And I remember one day when we were coming back from Ploesti, and we were pretty well shot up. 
and they have the 99th Squadron escorting us. And the 99th Squadron is composed of all blacks. And there were a lot of people that would say that the blacks were incapable of being good soldiers. Well, that's nonsense. Because these blacks were superb. And, and I remember when they appeared and we saw them from a distance. We didn't know whether they were enemy planes or our planes. And then the leader of the squadron, of the black 99th group, waggled his wings to indicate that he was a friend. And he said to us, hang on, white boy. He says, I'll take you home. And that was difficult. And so when, when, when they uh, escorted us home, our pilot, who was from the deepest and darkest part of Alabama, we had been in Barrie the next day, and he saw members of the, anti, uh, the 99th Squadron, and he had his arms around, buying them drinks. So, well, those kinds of experiences... I'm so glad that I was able to interview Mr. Deptula back in the 1990s. Hearing his story, paired with the interviews that Ben has done, has given me, and all of us, a much fuller picture of the Tuskegee Airmen and segregation during the Second World War. I don't think a lot of people realize, but there are World War II veterans living among us, and uh, to have the opportunity to meet and interact and, and get to know these brave men and women is really special, and especially interviewing these Tuskegee Airmen who live locally uh, was a real privilege for me. I went to visit Richard Hall, a Tuskegee Airman, on his 96th birthday uh, to take video and pictures of him uh, to preserve his memory in time. Well, I just started off by taking pictures at the end of the interview, and I realized how important they became. Uh, they were the final picture of these veterans, their final portrait. I think that the photographs that I take of these heroes uh, allows their memory to be preserved through time and the family members to have these pictures of their loved ones that will go on forever. I've done over a hundred interviews with World War II veterans to date and I'm going to continue to capture their stories and share them with future generations until there's no more World War II veterans left. And they're passing away at a rate of over 350 every single day.